Good day and welcome to another session of what on earth does God want me to do with my life. We've been preaching through the first two chapters of the book of Genesis, right in the beginning of your Bible. And we've been looking at the five things that God wants us to do with our life. If you've been following the series, you'll find out that actually there's a lot of resistance from the world, from the devil, and even from within ourselves to live out these five mandates, these five callings upon our lives. And if you've been following this series, you'll find out that the first calling that God has for you to live out is to live out a life of dominion, a life of rulership. You find that you have to rule over yourself, you have to rule over fear, you have to rule over the devil. One of my friends said this week, when they were so ill with getting sick, they, they said they had to realize that when they die, they, if they had to die, they would be with the Lord. And that helped them to overcome this overbearing fear that causes us not to really live out our lives. You see, as children of God, these five callings on your life are something that you're never going to get away from. If we follow the Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 text, we find out that the five things listed there are God wants us to have dominion and rulership, and God wants us to multiply His image. God wants us to multiply what He looks like on the earth. You know, as you raise your children, as you raise your spiritual children, you start to impart to them a way of living that causes them to multiply God's image on the earth. That's your second calling. This is those two first callings, dominion, rulership, and multiplying the image, are found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. Make sure you're reading those and that you're meditating on them so that you do spend your life multiplying the image of God on the earth. It is a lifelong calling. It's never going to go away. It's something that God expects you and calls you to live out. The third thing that God wants us to do is to work. And we've done seven sermons on work. We've been finding out that God has blessed us with the opportunity to be just like Him, in that He also is working. And so we behave like our Father. We live like the Son, like Jesus, who came to the earth and gave His life to bring the salvation that we now enjoy. Jesus is working. And not only that, the Holy Spirit is working. You and I have been called to a life of work. If you think about it, if you include schooling, your, work, your life consists of 70 years of working maybe even longer, you might as well do it properly. When we look at these five mandates, these five calls of God, we find that we can't really get away from them. The fourth calling, also found in Genesis 2 verse 15, is that God wants you to look after or take care of that which you're working on. You know, when you work, you find that it starts to produce things for you. You start to derive benefit and wealth from it. But you're also called to look after that which your work produces. The Bible calls this to take care of or manage or to even steward that which God has given us. God has blessed us with so many things that we are called to steward or to look after. The fifth thing, of course, is found in the end of Genesis chapter 2, the last nine verses, where he tells us to get married, and he describes the marriage ceremony as that commitment that we make in front of the people of God as we call to love and to serve one another in the beauty of a thing, an institution called marriage. What a blessing marriage can be when it's done God's way. All five of these things, God tells us how to do them. You know, the Bible from the beginning is telling us how we are to exercise rule and dominion, telling us how to multiply the image of God. 
telling us how to work, telling us how to steward and how to be married. These are rules. Of course, we live in a world that doesn't like rules. They say, no, we're not under rules or, or law, we're under grace. But the Bible is full of wisdom on how to live out these five mandated calls in your life. And we're going to look at the third one. As I said, this is sermon number eight on work. How does God call you to work? The last two weeks, we looked at five ways that God wants you to work. Today, we're going to look at one of the pitfalls or the dangers that can so easily happen when we don't follow God's way of working. I'm talking about the green-eyed monster of jealousy. When we are jealous in our work situation or jealous because others have work or jealous in our effort to do work, we find that that jealousy will prevent our progress in our work situation. Do you know that all witchcraft is based on jealousy? About being jealous about what somebody else has or doesn't have. And none more so in a world where employment and work is so scarce. All over the place, believers and unbelievers become jealous because of the work that others have. Now, if you're jealous as a child of God, you will find it will prevent your progression in your work situation. You'll be hindered. You will be stymied or short-circuited in your effort to grow and enjoy your work as the way that you worship God. Let's look in the story of the Bible, by the way, if the fourth chapter of Genesis turn there so long, we're going to look at the life of two men who worked, and we're going to see the contrast about one work, the one way the one brother worked and the other way the other brother worked, and the effect that it had upon their lives. Genesis chapter 4, of course, tells us the story about the two brothers Cain and Abel. Cain was the older brother. He was the firstborn. And in that way, he had, it seems, many more benefits. Abel was the secondborn. And he didn't have as many benefits. But just because of this green-eyed monster of jealousy, we're going to see that Cain's progress, Cain's increase in life was hindered because of jealousy. Jealousy will always damage your work life, especially preventing you going forward or increasing and progressing in your work life. Let's read Genesis chapter 4. We're going to read from the second half of verse 2. He says these words, Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Verse 6. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. You must master sin, Cain. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. When the Lord said to Abel, Where is your, excuse me, when the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? He said, I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? Listen. Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. 
Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground which opens its mouth, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from the land, from your hands. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield it its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. What a tragic story. But I want you to see that all of it started because of Cain's jealousy towards his brother's work and towards the offering that his brother's work produced. You'll see that key thought or that key verse that it says in verse 7 that sin is crouching at the door of your heart or of our heart to try and take us over. You know, jealousy is everywhere. You might be sitting there saying, John, I don't struggle with jealousy. I don't struggle with anybody who I'm jealous at work. But I want you to understand that jealousy starts in and has very many different forms. Jealousy can start as it did here with sibling rivalry. You might be jealous of your brother or your sister. You might be even be jealous of your parents. Jealousy starts in the heart in a very young age and must be managed, as he said, sin is crouching, verse 7, sin is crouching at your door. Jealousy can work into our hearts and will cause all kinds of resentments for unforgiveness and even bitterness. This is what happened to this man Cain. You get, as I said, different kinds of jealousy. You even get a jealousy where we are jealous of those who we work with. We kind of say, well, why should they get ahead? I work harder than them. Why do they get paid more than me? I'm a harder worker. I'm a better worker than them. This starts to affect your job and your work life. You may even be jealous of somebody having more opportunities in life. I remember my one friend said to me, John, I couldn't make it at school because in the 10 years of, of my education, we moved 20 times in life. How many of you not, haven't had to struggle with that? But I remember my friend describing that as a great pain in his life, something that he looked at others and he said, oh, I wish and I long that I wasn't brought up like that. That can produce that jealousy and that resentment, that bitterness, even that accusation against God and against our parents and just in general against life. You see, jealousy starts and comes in many different forms. I even think of a different kind of jealousy, a jealousy that says, why is that person a favorite and I'm not a favorite? Perhaps you're one of those people who never felt favored in life. Perhaps when, you know, they were giving up, uh, choosing positions for a, for a sport, you were always the one who got chosen last. All of these areas cause that little seed of jealousy to fall into our heart and begin to work against the benefits of knowing what God wants us to have and the progress that God wants us to have in our lives. Look at what happened to this man, Cain. You know, I always think about how Cain's life was on such a downward slope and how it can so easily happen. Always remember this. Promotion doesn't come from the north, the south, the east or the west. It doesn't come from anywhere else. Promotion comes from God. There's a wonderful scripture that actually says this. Psalm 75, verse 6 and 7, it says, promotion comes from God. You might look at somebody else and say, I work harder than them. My work life has been longer than them. But always remember that promotion is from the Lord. It says in that Psalm, Psalm 75, especially read it in the old King James Version. It, it says it so beautifully as it often does in that older translation. But verse 7 says these words, it says, God is the judge. One he elevates, one he, provoke, he promotes, and another one he puts down. You need to understand that it's not your ambition 
that drives you to the front of the queue or to the top of the pile. It's your trust in God. Promotion comes from the Lord. And of course, this man came. He didn't know this. He didn't realize or he disobeyed God. And he thought he could try and get to the front. He could try and become that person that he really wanted to be by his own ambition and drive. And it caused him to be jealous towards his brother. The downward spiral, as I said, starts in verse 7, where it says the sin of jealousy, the sin of bitterness, the sin of resentment, the sin of unforgiveness towards his parents and towards his, his brother was crouching at the door. Sin crouching, looking for an opportunity to get in. The sin of jealousy. That's what happened to him. You'll see that he succumbs to it. And there's some clues that help us to see this. Look at verse 3 where it says that, you know, Cain offered some fruits of the soil. That seems like an innocent scripture, verse 3. But you, when you look at verse 4, it says Abel offered the firstborn of the flock. Can you hear the difference? He took the first, he took the best. And he offered that to God as an offering. Instead of his brother being led by that example, Cain became jealous of that. You know, this firstborn means that Abel trusted God that he would give him more cows and more cattle and more goats. That this firstborn was not a bad offering, but it was a good offering for Abel to be giving God. You know that it says this is really the, 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 the truth that tithes are based on. You take the best of your work that you have produced, the money that comes to you, the first 10%, and you give that to God as an offering. You see, Cain didn't do that. He just took some any old vegetables from the vegetable patch and offered it to God. Whereas Abel took the first and the best. That's how God wants you to live your life out of work. Give God your best. Give Him as an act of worship the best of your work that you could do. The downward spiral for Cain continues here. Can you see verse 5? It says those words. Cain became very angry and downcast. Do you know that a sign of having Jealousy in your life is your face begins to get downcast. You become angry. Everything you're angry at. Why didn't this work out? And shouldn't that have worked out? And how come that person benefited and I didn't get benefit? Very angry. And the face starts to tell exactly where your heart is. Very downcast. Of course, in contrast, we have this beautiful picture of Abel offering God his offering with thanksgiving from the work that his offering had come from. Can you see? Well, we can't see it so much here in the verses, but Hebrews chapter 11, 4 tells us that Abel offered a better sacrifice because he offered it in faith towards God. The life of faith is a life of thanksgiving and gratefulness. And that's the difference between these two brothers when it came to their job and to their work situation. The downward spiral of Cain continues in verse 7. Look, it says that sin was crouching, this jealousy, this resentment, this bitterness was crouching at his door. His work no longer became an act of worship. It became an act of, or a reason to be jealous with his brother. Look what it says, that this unbelief of sin crouching at his door eventually overwhelmed him. And in verse 8, it tells us he committed murder. I know a lot of people who would want to murder me, but they don't because they'll get caught and put in jail. You might know some people who want to murder you, but they are too afraid because they're too afraid of jail. 
But you know you can murder with your mouth? Remember how Jesus taught this in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, if you say to your brother, are you fool? If you speak against your brother in that way, if you speak against somebody out of an act of jealousy, out of an act of resentment, an act of unforgiveness, you start to affect this very, very powerful third calling on your life. You start to affect your work. Murder is something that happens in your heart and it gets spoken out, out of your mouth. It doesn't need to involve a gun or a knife or poison. But it does start with a sense of hatred and a sense of jealousy and resentment in your heart towards others. Keep the sin of jealousy at bay. As verse 7 said, it crouches at the door of every person's life. And you and I have to master it or else it begins to affect our work. Look at the next verse, what it says. The, the, this verse 9, it says, Cain developed this I don't care attitude. You know, this God says to him, where's your brother? He says, I don't know. What, what am I, my brother's keeper? What, are I, what does it matter to me? I don't care. Have you seen that with somebody when it comes to their work or it comes to the care of somebody else? Oh, I don't care. I call parts of this generation the the whatever generation. Oh, whatever. How oh, did you hear what happened to so-and-so's leg? Oh, whatever. You see, this is the downward spiral, the sin and jealousy and resentment takes root in our heart and deeply affects our work life. And you see, the dreadful thing that happens to work for Cain in verse 11 and 12. It says that God cursed Cain's work. What a terrible thing. What a dreadful thing. Going to work every day knowing that there's a curse of God on your work. And that, the, that forever you're going to be, as he calls him, a restless wanderer. Somebody who's never going to be able to settle down. Somebody who's never going to be able to get ahead in life. Have you ever looked across the, across the spectrum of your friends and family and said, I wonder why he gets ahead in life. I wonder why she seems to progress with her work. I want to tell you that the Bible here in Genesis chapter 4 is giving us the very secret of how to become prospered and blessed in your work situation. Can you see that it says God actually cursed Cain's work. It wasn't a blessing for him anymore. It didn't bring him blessing. It just caused him heartache and pain. I don't want this to be your situation for your work. And I certainly don't want any of my, my fellow brothers and sisters to not progress in their work situation. You see, ambition is not a bad thing. But when ambition causes you to be jealous, bitter and resentful, even unforgiving towards others, it will prevent your progress in life. I found that some people in their work situation and in their stewardship of their wealth go around the same mountain year after year after year. They never seem to get ahead. Their children never seem to get ahead because they're working with the same heart as Cain. And not with the faith-filled heart of Abel. Look at verse 14. It says the most tragic words in this story. That Cain lost the presence of God in his work. Could you imagine going to work and not knowing the presence of God, the favor of God, the blessing of God on your daily work? What a tragedy. Pray, God, that you and your children never experience this when it comes to work. That you live this life above jealousy, above the frustrations and the resentments that so easily want to prevent our progress when it comes to work. In closing, I want us to pray together to make sure that as a child of God, we are not calling our work boring or a rat race or empty or it just feels so futile. Or, you know what, I just don't want to go to work this week because 
It just feels like the same old, same old. There's no vision. There's no progress. There's no future in my work. I want us to pray that this will change for you. And it's all very well praying. But if you're sitting in this position of a deep jealousy and resentment towards others, a deep, a deep unforgiveness and anger towards others, I want you to understand that it's going to affect your progress of your work. And sometimes it takes more than prayer. You need to go and speak to somebody. I want to tell you that you need to speak to one of your house church pastors. Someone who will take the time to listen to you and pray with you. Someone who will remind you to deal with the sin of jealousy that's crouching at your door. Seeking to scuttle and take away God's blessing from your life. So I am going to pray now. But this may require more than prayer. This may require you going and confessing your sins. As the Bible says in James chapter 5, confess your sins one to another. You know, you can't make any progress. You can't make any blessing in your work unless forgiveness and confession is a deep and significant part of your life. Remember how Jesus even taught that when he said, when you pray the Lord's prayer daily, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. As I'm praying, I'm going to ask God to encourage you to go and speak to somebody if you're struggling with the sin of jealousy, resentment and anger, unforgiveness towards those around you. And then act on it. Don't wait for God to send you a special sign. This is the sign. Go and approach somebody. Go and approach a house church leader, one of your pastors, who you know will pray for you and break the agreement that you've made with this sin of jealousy, the sin of resentment and unforgiveness in your life. Let's pray right now and ask God to give you the courage to go and speak to somebody. Heavenly Father, thank you for the wondrous blessing of work. I pray for everybody who's hearing my voice from this preach and from this teach. That Lord, you will encourage them. You will strengthen them. You will embolden them to get out of the sin of jealousy, resentment, unforgiveness and bitterness, Lord. And Lord, you will give them the courage to go and speak to somebody. To go and break that agreement that sits as a great shadow over their work. And that prevents them from going on in life. Father, we commit ourselves to you and to this work of we this week of work that you have given us. Bless our work, Lord. Bless everything that we undertake as we do it as an act of worship towards you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I bless you. God bless you. And I'll see you next time.